Hi everyone. All right, I'll get started on this. Uh, today's lecture is going to be a little more introductory. This is just going to be a kind of whirlwind tour of the course and different aspects of it, as well as bring us to a sort of critical and cultural understanding of why did we, you know, why is this course even exist? And why, why should you take it? And why um, <clears throat> maybe you shouldn't take it? Uh, depending on what your interests are. So I'll jump in. It's a new course for me, first of all. So I haven't taught this course, but it does gather a lot of things that I have taught. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here and, and touch on a lot of different topics, um, mainly to do with generative models, like images, text, sound, synthesis type of models. Uh, but we're also going to touch on cultural topics such as appropriation, bias, and the ethics of AI. And so today will just be a sort of whirlwind tour, um, more of an ether and like space of questions that we will offer up and that will give us a critical framing for the rest of the course, which will be much more technical. So by the end of today, we'll have uh, many threads that hopefully we'll be able to dive deeper into. Um, this course isn't really just about creating pretty pictures or sounds or whatnot. Uh, there are plenty of courses like that online, on YouTube, elsewhere. But really what I'd, I'm hoping to enable all of you to do is really build a critical frame of reference about why these techniques were developed and what the trajectory of these techniques are leading towards, what its effects on society have been, and how, if at all, it will fit in within your practice how you can integrate these um, questions and different techniques into that. So I believe as an educator of machine learning, I have some responsibility to not just educate you on, you know, how to do the newest image generation technique, but also uh, bring you up to speed and build a framing for the societal and cultural questions. So uh, hence the provocative title of the course, Cultural Appropriation with Machine Learning. Um, so we'll, we'll learn more about that aspect of it, but certainly there's a lot more um, critical aspects that touch beyond the creative aspects in terms of colonialism, capitalism, automation, surveillance, uh, the ethics of it as well, and much more. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the logistics of the course a bit first. We're going to be using primarily these tools throughout the rest of the course, Runway um, ML, Google Colab, and the Python programming language within Google Colab. Um, if you don't have any programming experience, this course will be a little difficult for you. Um, I will try to guide you, but I do think that it would be difficult. Um, if you do have any programming experience at all, I think that um, we will try to draw on that a bit. Um, if you've seen any of my previous course material from the Cadenze course or any other online material that I've taught, you can kind of get a flavor for um, the amount of guidance that I give uh, students in, in during the exercises. Um, this course is going to be even more guided than that, I think. So there's um, a lot of uh, potential for you to learn the language as you go along, I think. So uh, jumping in, uh, I'll try to take a break um, at in half an hour's time, if that sounds okay. All right, so why a course on cultural appropriation of machine learning? I don't think that any such course exists out there, uh, but perhaps by the end of this course, you'll fully understand why I believe there's a need for this course, at least the way that uh, we'll approach it. Uh, we're going to be looking at both critical and practical aspects, and you'll find endless critical debates with machine learning that we can dive into uh, within each focus of either critical or the practical. There's plenty of reading material. But this course is really meant to be a very coarse overview of both topics um, with the special focus on this cultural content part of machine learning, which um, as artists, perhaps as generative artist, if you end up um, labeling yourself that, or if you want to <clears throat> work with these techniques, you're going to be working with the manipulation, generation, and appropriation of culture uh, in the form of digital media. So of all the critical aspects that we could have addressed with machine learning, why should we <clears throat> center on this topic of cultural appropriation? 
So certainly there's many things to be critical of, but we can't focus on all of them on such a short amount of time. Ethical considerations, job automation, fairness, bias, plenty more. Uh, these are all really salient and important topics, but somehow specific to the arts and the practice of machine learning for a media artist that engages with media production, content such as video, live installation, image, sound, specific to these sorts of art practitioners, the role of machine learning is often content generation. And so this is an important slice of this problem of machine learning. Um, so as an artist working with machine learning, you're often focused more on the generation of content than say classifying people into categories and labeling them. Uh, or even building robots, though many artists work on this as well. So the focus of this course and the computational arts practices that we'll look at in this course um, is around this idea of content generation. Yeah, and obviously, you know, if you turn on the news, these tools are being employed today to topple governments and sway public opinion in what you know, is not really hyperbole to say global psyops and warfare. And um, it's no mistake that people call this a, a new arms race. Um, so we're going to be learning these tools, so we, we better be really cognizant of them. So with this frame in mind, and like this frame of computational artists working with content generation, what problems do you think could arise in such practices or that you've already seen? What sort of problems do you think could arise with such practices focused on machine learning, content generation, or have already seen? We've got Netflix rec recommendations, so personalization. Yeah, there's the idea of personalization. It's overfitting, perhaps, that causes um, this amplification of certain ideas, or they could even be persuaded to um, fit another person's idea of what should be consumed uh, through advertising revenue. ML creating bland TV, of course, yeah. So the kind of whole automation of script writing and production and even like who should act and where they should act. Yeah, the whole Western European centric uh, content uh, bias, uh, machine learning only reproducing what it already has seen, huge, hugely uh, problematic not just for content generation, but in practically all aspects of machine learning, can intensify ableism. Yeah, the designers of these tools and the ways in which they integrate them um, likely come from a specific set of people. Access to a bank account perhaps might only be enabled by smartphones in certain places which cost money. Yeah, these are all really great, great ideas, um, very, Recognizant of what's happening out there in the world. Great. Feel free to continue with that. I'm going to continue with the short list that I had come up with. Um, so deep fakes we'll talk about in a bit, misrepresentation and slander. You can imagine in the space of content generation that people could try to represent somebody uh, maliciously or through slander or say that they had said something uh, which they didn't or make them to look like they had done something which they hadn't and put them into a place where they hadn't been. <clears throat> Job automation, which you had touched on as well. Uh, forgery, which kind of in the same vein of deep fakes. Uh, spam, so you can imagine just silencing or uh, sort of dead ending a conversation by just spamming it with endless troll bots and um, ideas that maybe aren't even from real people or just to um, set up revenue streams. Uh, cultural appropriation, which we'll talk a bit more about, security and privacy. There's a good list. Um, just checking what else is on the Google Doc. We have health tracking, health insurance, ethics issues. So what is cultural appropriation? There's a lot of great material on this topic, and I'm by no means an expert on the subject. I, I wish I were an expert on this. Um, these are uh, some texts that I've uh, read that I think that the class would benefit from reading is certainly not the um, focus of the course to become experts on cultural appropriation or literary theory aside from, um, uh, you know, how we'll uh, talk about it currently. There's 
there's a lot to go into with cultural appropriation, essentially. Um, Norman Myler in 1956 it talks about hipsters' appropriation of black culture more recently in a uh, revived new work by Lauren Michelle Jackson in 2019. In both, the authors talk about oppressive relationships between white people and black people through the act of cultural appropriation. So there's often that, um, uh, that, uh, that power um, hierarchy created through this uh, act of cultural appropriation. So it raises many questions as well. You can imagine that there's uh, perhaps a line that people would find uh, that divides appre appreciation and appropriation. But both are really calls to awareness. They aren't, um, in these texts, they're not really trying to provide, specifically in these texts, aren't trying to provide any answers to what is or what is not appropriation, but really it, it's trying to give you the ability to ask the right questions if you see or are borrowing from other cultures. And as we'll see in the context of machine learning, we're often borrowing digital media from other people. So it's really important to be aware of those questions. For a more precise definition, you can read this text by Fordham University law professor, Su Susan Scafidi, who defines cultural appropriation as uh, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. So this can include unauthorized use of another culture's dance, dress, music, language, folklore, cuisine, um, medicine, religious symbols, whatever. And very often those who are appropriating culture of another group profit from their exploitation. So they not only gain money, but also status from popularizing art forms or modes of expression or other customs uh, of marginalized groups. So there's a pretty big red flag for you if you find yourself training a model on content from another culture and profiting from it. You should really be asking yourself if this is okay. Um, with this definition, we can see cultural creation appearing in many contexts, um, cultural colonialism, the anthropology of indigenous cultures, the Harlem Renaissance, each often involves the appropriation and colonization of an oppressed or minority culture. That very often we'll see this in music or fashion or in advertising and meme culture. <clears throat> Simply we can define it as the popular use and misuse of a cultural artifact, often for the profit for another without proper representation or credit of the appropriated. But um, depending on the culture and the misuse, the intent and the context, there can be an argument for whether or not something is or is not culturally appropriated. In um, Cultural Appropriation in the Arts, this fourth text listed here, uh, James Young explores both ethical and aesthetic issues of cultural appropriation, focused on the arts, with a particularly controversial stance um, where the artistic license and freedom of the artist are foregrounded over values of an oppressed or appropriated culture. So Young asks, is there really ownership over culture, considering an individual may be bi or multicultural, groups may overlap or hard to, hard to define, and that cultures involve subsets of humanities. <clears throat> if cultural uh, appropriation occurs when one culture of some member of that culture takes and uses materials from another culture, then it implies some first usage of a cultural artifact which claims a proprietary relation to the materials as its owner or maker. Um, but what seems to be missing from Young's discourse is the really important colonial relationships that are created by appropriation. Um, just worth mentioning this text, I think. Uh, finally, Emma Dabiri uh, offers yet another example, um, much more recent text, and there's actually a clip in The Guardian, um, which you can look at. Uh, the linked PDF slides hopefully um, take you to that link. So please check that out um, in your own time. So what I want us to reflect on here isn't really like arguing for what is or isn't cultural appropriation or creating a literary framework for cultural appropriation or even really to justify whether or not one is an instance of appropriation or if it's right or wrong. But really it's just to make us think and think critically while applying tools that are increasingly capable of ingesting large amounts of cultural content 
and have been and will continue to be used in systems of oppression. You as artists, lucky enough to be taught these tools and have time to digest and reflect on them and integrate them within your practice, you have an opportunity to tell the world about these tools beyond you know, simply what is shown in the media and uh, the existing artists of today that have um, used these tools have done. Yeah, I will I will try not to harp on this, but it is a sore point for me. Sore enough that I've created a whole course um, about this topic. <laughs> so I will ask you to try not try and not treat you know these tools as simply black boxes or uh, boxes rather abstractions of technical tools. You know that you can somehow forget how it works because it is so prescient to today. You know a lot is happening with these tools, unfortunately, and um, I'm asking you to be more critical of them before you use them. Before you take a large corpus of lyrical data, you know, and act like you have created the life of a rapper and, you know, like ask yourself, why am I doing that? Like whose culture am I appropriating, if any? And what does that message send those that I'm appropriating from, if any? I'll try to, you know, give you a bit more reference on cultural appropriation. Um, so for instance, there's, uh, of course, Picasso. Um, very early on, you know, there, there are narratives within art history that talk about um, the style of Cubist painting resembling uh, carved African masks. And in cultural appropriation in the arts, Young's talks about this and has a particular view. Um, you can dive into that in your own time and really uh, take a lesson from art history here as well um, and expand on that in your own time. Minstrel theater as well, uh, Birth of a Nation. So this is Al Jolson and this time period in 1915 was really accented by this racist classic, The Birth of a Nation. And it was basically a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so this is another example of cultural appropriation more recently, we have um, Shudu, and hands up if you've seen Shudu. Okay, so this is another example of cultural appropriation. I'll talk about that in a bit as um, why that is, if it's not clear yet. How about Lil Michaela, pictured here in the center? So both Shudu and Lil Michaela are CG models created by um, this person here on the left, Cameron James Wilson. It is um, his company that has created the Digitals, the, first, uh, the world's first all digital modeling agency. And so I personally hope that none of you end up creating anything like this. Um, but you know, some of the techniques that we'll learn in this course will really enable you to, um, Lil Michaela, oh, is it? I thought the, uh, Digitals had created Lil Michaela. I could be wrong on that. Brad FY. Okay. Apologies. I will um, have to update that on my notes. Uh, I'll dig into that more. Thank you for pointing that out for me. Um, in the case of Shudu and the digitals, let's say, um, there is, in either case, I would say that there is this argument perhaps for diversity. And if you look at interviews by Cameron James Wilson, you'll talk, you'll see that, you know, his motivation for this was as a direct quote, um, oh, I just wanted to see if I could do it and if people would be able to tell if it was real or not. And it's a fairly common attitude in tech. Like, you know, I just wanted to see if it would work, like how far it would go. Like, I just, you know, want to see if the tech would do that idea or not. You know, and that's kind of what I'm hoping that none of you do, you know, like have that curiosity, have that, you know, endless creative um, pursuit, but also like have the critical framing, you know, um, so there's perhaps a critical framing for diversity here, like, you know, by seeing more portrayals of more diverse people in the media, even if they're computer generated, there's more diversity, right? Maybe, but then what does that mean if the diversity comes from white males, like where is the inclusivity? How does that allow an actual black female to get a job? And isn't it automation really at the end of the day, like automating away black models jobs? So um, yeah, just a concern there. So I will move on. We've uh, hopefully built 
enough of a frame for you know why and what has already existed in terms of cultural appropriation what i want to talk about now is really the representation of culture and this is setting up really what it means to work with machine learning like why is it that uh, machine learning can even appropriate culture like it would first have to understand culture right and so th this is kind of what i'm hinting at with this next section is what does it mean to think about in a perceptual sense um culture in terms of digital media and eventually in terms of what a machine learning algorithm could perhaps represent so in order to understand this we can take it back to history uh, again back to picasso 1912 and the idea of um, cultural barring uh, here was really political statements and the idea of found objects and collage can really be seen as more of a critical stance on victorian stances of painting and realist practice so i'm not an art historian or a cultural theorist so i'll give you like just the you know the uh, cliff notes here but basically brock and um, picasso were um, experimenting with these ideas of the oil cloth and representing different textures and uh, the cloth here was a commercial object. It had like low cultural value, but being juxtaposed with the high society artifact, this painting, and that's very unusual for the time. And so you can see that that would create a political stance, like a, a it would create something that as um, a painter, you just wouldn't normally do. Um, so there's, there are other narratives here that um, are at play in the idea of collage. Um, that at that time existed, but obviously now if you take whatever mixed media thing and put it into a pile of whatever and say that that's art, like, you know, sure, there's something there, but like that same narrative won't exist, unfortunately, now. So um, just something to think about as you move into this future of generative work of arts um, and you're taking fragments of culture you know, what is the narrative there? What is it that you're saying when you make that work of art? Um, so this is, I would say, like a visual example of cultural fragments. And um, throughout this course, I'm going to try and move between three modalities, the, the visual, then there will be this textual, and then um, the next modality will be the sonic. So as a textual example <clears throat> of cultural fragmentation, we have the Dadaists and the Surrealists. And the founder of Surrealism, Andre Breton, uh, describes his practice of collage in the Manifest du Surrealism, um, published in 1924, and in terms of an image created by the mind that could not be born from a comparison, but only from a juxtaposition of two distant realities. And so he also talked about this parlor game, um, which you might have heard of, The Exquisite Corpse, which had participants collectively assemble text or images using simple rules like adjective and noun, and this was in the early 20s. Um, in a similar vein to Exquisite Corpse, there was Tristan Zara, um, which in the 20s at a Dadaist rally uh, performed a poem by taking cut up fragments of text-based media, such as newspapers or brochures out of a hat, and read them out loud. And uh, eventually that led to some riot that destroyed the theater and like he got expelled from the movement. But, um, you know, fast forward, T.S. Eliot's using this in The Wasteland, James Joyce Ulysses, um, both, both published in 1922. And Caught Up was also later rediscovered in the 60s by Brian Geisen and um, William Burroughs. And uh, so Naked Lunch, for instance, is a kind of notable example of this technique. Um, and the third mind uh, as well. Uh, also heavily influential in later, art, later artists, um, David Bowie and Kurt Cobain, Radiohead, all played with this technique. Okay, um, moving on. We have uh, Daphne Arm, who um, in the 40s, She's in her early 20s now. She becomes the co-founder of the BBC Radiophonics. And um, she is the first turntablist in the 40s. 
working on a live radio broadcast of some live performance of an orchestral piece. <clears throat> and she would keep that orchestral piece in sync with the recorded version of the concert. And if there was an air raid, uh, whatnot, she would switch over to the pre-recorded um, version. She later developed this technique into what she calls double orchestra. And uh, her work in 1949, Still Point, is arguably the first ever piece of music to require live electronic manipulation of acoustic material. Um, she's really fascinating. It's like crazy how many things that she's done and has been involved in. Highly, highly recommend you check her out. Um, she developed this drawn sound technique synthesizer called the Aramix machine and it involved drawing on plates of glass and like film reels and just this absurd thing. Um, but again, you have this idea of fragments of cultural content uh, on tape media, uh, which, you know, obviously uh, later became a much more standard practice that, that was kind of informed, I would say, by this school in, um, in France, the Musique Concrète and Pierre Schaeffer. Um, this idea is talked about a lot in, in different books. I think Aguillard and Torg is a really good book. Let me know if you're interested in learning more about that. I can point you to that. Um, but Pierre Schaeffer basically was arguing that classical music practice begins with a set of abstractions, which are notated on sheet music and then later reproduced as audible music. Music concrete, on the other hand, begins with recordings of the sound outputs themselves and then tries to work back to the raw sonic outputs towards any abstractions that may describe them. He's kind of flipping this narrative of sound and Xenakis, a Greek composer as well in the 60s, I think, was also exploring this idea of sound collage. And uh, there's a quote from him that says, um, all sound, even continuous musical variation, is conceived as an assemblage of large number of elementary sounds adequately disposed in time. So that's uh, that resonates with me a lot, especially if you um, start to interrogate these machine learning algorithms in what they're actually doing in their early layers. You'll start to see that, oh, these are actually the elementary sounds that uh, a composer like Xenakis might have liked to have composed with, you know, taking the resulting piece of music and working towards the sets of abstractions that describes them. That is what machine learning tries to do. It looks at this large amount of music, in the case of sound uh, or music, and it will try to find the elementary atoms that decompose that set of larger amounts of music and try to recompose it. So we'll, we'll see that process again and again. Okay, so we're just about ready to take our break but just to wrap up you know we've covered three sort of disparate mediums roughly a hundred years ago which all seem to tackle this idea of cultural fragmentation and representation and then through this juxtaposition and collage of these somehow disparate elements they try to find new meaning uh, so we left off with uh, cultural fragments and we've just covered uh, Daphne Orm and music concrete uh, at this point, I want to ask the course, um, the uh, everybody, you know, like, where else do you think that we can see cultural copies or borrowing of culture? <clears throat> and I've kind of set up this narrative up until now that, you know, perhaps it was um, a bad thing coming from cultural appropriation. But then, you know, we looked at three examples, which perhaps aren't a bad thing. Um, at least they were uh, very revolutionary in, in terms of arts practices, or at least as they're historicized and written about. Um, but where else can we see the idea of cultural copies and barring taking place? So. Um, I was just thinking, so I'm moving to this place in Pasadena. And um, one of the things that I immediately thought to do was like check the address on the native land map. Um, and I feel like that's becoming more of a trend recently, which is a really great thing where people are doing um, land acknowledgements. And it's not really like a cultural copying thing, but I feel like it can, um, I don't know, like I don't really think that I should put it in the Google Doc because it doesn't really like fill the requirement of cultural borrowing, but it was just something I thought about. And it's a good thing. Yeah, when you're borrowing land effectively. <laughs> so yeah, it's good. 
Yeah, we were, I think I saw something in the news just today about um, <clears throat> the wildfires happening in California and across the West Coast and how um, indigenous um, peoples had whole practices for controlled burns. And, you know, here we are uh, trying to figure it out when it's too late, kind of, you know. So there's that idea of um, trying to bar the land, but not necessarily understanding how to take care of it. Perhaps Milan, yes, <laughs> awesome. Music videos, definitely. There's um, within that as well the music, but also the video, the culture surrounding videos. Avatar: The Last Airbender. Um, does anyone want to elaborate on that? I'm not familiar. Oh, I typed that one in. Um, they have like the different tribes, all like based on like actual populations and cultures. And like oh, really? the way that they move when they do their bending is also based on that too. Right, right. Yeah, and so there could be um, representation or misrepresentation there. Trends like TikTok dances, that is, uh, that's great. Yeah, that's pretty much set up to enforce cultural borrowing and copies. We've got um, advertising product services starring foreign celebrities in the culture, Korean celebrities, um, uh, to make the products services more noticeable, absolutely. There's um, a topic within that we might touch on later. Is it in this slide? But there are services uh, that allow you to, based in Pasadena as well, there's a, a service which allows you to um, send a video message with your favorite celebrity in any language that you want, uh, starring that celebrity, perhaps related to this. Let's see. Um, yeah, like a, more of a uh, puppetry or caricature of that um, celebrity, you know, like a virtual greeting card, sort of. Music genres, yoga for sure, commodified spiritualism, yes. Um, LA. <laughs> Let's see. Uncanny Valley for sure. This is a short list that I'd come up with. It's much coarser than the examples that you um, were working on. Um, and it's really just to provide a, you know, a bit of a brain dump, one, but also like two, to say that, you know, cultural car copies or borrowing is really ingrained in <laughs> a lot of things that we, um, we consume in terms of media, um, fashion, poetry, uh, even this course is somehow like, you know, an amalgamation of many ideas that aren't necessarily mine. So, uh, obviously, this is ingrained in the human experience. Um, genes and memes being, you know, the biological and the cultural layers of that idea, uh, really. Yeah, so just to say that, you know, this is part of human experience is not necessarily a bad thing. There's certainly many good things about that. And, um, you know, it's just the critical frame. That's, that's all I want to nail home is that we should be asking the questions, that's all. So moving on, um, deep fakes. Sorry, let me bring up my notes. So there's a new book on this that just came out like yesterday, I think, or it's even on, only on pre-order, so I dropped it in the slides. But I haven't checked it out personally, um, but it, re you know, Andrew Yang apparently reviewed it, so um, it can't be all that bad, right? Um, who knows, but there's a, this looks like a good introduction to the subject of deep fakes. If you're interested in that and want to dig more, then check it out and uh, the website itself, which is linked on the slides uh, to learn more. Um, if you're not familiar with what a deep fake is, uh, you know, the, there are some videos linked in the slides. Um, maybe we can watch one together. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, hands up if you haven't seen a deep fake. Okay, so hopefully, um, I mean, if you haven't, you know, feel free to check out the slides and this video is linked. There's Mark Zuckerberg talking about, um, you know, basically the profitability of Facebook and how they sell their information and, you know, things that he wouldn't normally say basically, but using his voice through a text-to-speech artificial intelligence algorithm, which we'll be looking at later in this course. So we will um, see effectively how to train a text-to-speech model of somebody else's voice. And, you know, we could do some pretty malicious stuff with that. Uh, so 
yeah, think about it. <laughs> and then we have here, um, is this David Beckham? I always forget who this is. I think it's David Beckham um, speaking on a malaria campaign to raise awareness about malaria. So, you know, on the flip side, perhaps there's a really good thing that we can do with uh, deep fake. You know, we can actually use David Beckham to spread this message in many different languages. Uh, but then again, we also have this other narrative of well, like, well, couldn't we just have invited other people that know those languages to speak about these things? But, you know, so those, there are questions here that you, you can ask if, um, you know, having gone through this course of you now that those are the questions you should be asking. Uh, there's a really good YouTube um, channel called Speaking of AI. Uh, where you can see many more examples of deep fakes that are audio deep fakes. There's also a podcast series uh, called 20,000 Hertz, and they invite the creator of this YouTube channel to talk more about this. And it's it's well worth a listen. It's a short, short one. And if you're interested in the topic of audio deep fakes, uh, to learn more about it and kind of get an idea of the quality that you can get with um, today's text-to-speech algorithms. So we've kind of seen like the marriage of um, audio and visual uh, aspects of deep fakes, but what about text? Is there a deep fake for text? Yes, obviously there's uh, um, a lot we can do with text generation and it's a bit scary uh, to me. It's, like, it's a lot scary really uh, what's happening with text generation. Um, there are even companies that are releasing the text generation algorithms, OpenAI in particular, um, on their previous iteration of the state-of-the-art text generation model, which is called GPT. At that time, it was GPT-2. Um, before they even released it, they had released a whole press release saying that you know, this is too controversial. Like, you know, we can't put this in the hands of everybody. Otherwise, who knows what will happen. So we're, we're going to, um, I did have GPT-3 access for a month, yes, but now it's um, unfortunately turned into a paid service. So OpenAI, uh, the creators of GPT, um, at the time that they released GPT-2 um, said that this is, you know, a, something that we shouldn't release to the public because who knows what the public will do with it. So rather than talking to the academic community, they went to a handful of journalists um, and said like, you know, what could go wrong? And of course the journalists all wrote about it and uh, praised OpenAI and it was like a huge media hype campaign for OpenAI. Meanwhile, the academic community who's been really thinking about these problems and knows the questions to ask about these problems were kind of left in the dark. Meanwhile, they released GPT-3. And um, at that time, they, for some reason, didn't have the same concerns and they just released it to everybody. And uh, um, well, they released it to a lot of people. Basically, if you asked for access at a certain point, you would get access to it. And um, meanwhile, they also released the full GPT-2 models. So you have access to the previous um, iterations of GPT-2. And uh, it's, it's pretty insane what it's capable of doing. Um, uh, there was a book uh, released by a friend, Kenrick McDowell, um, just today, a whole book written uh, with conversations of this uh, open AI model. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot that you can do with this model. It's essentially it's learned to ingest the entirety of the web and the text uh, on the web, which a lot of it comes from Reddit, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view. And uh, previous chat algorithms that had learned to generate text, um, previous algorithms had basically learned to uh, you know, regurgitate what it was trained on. And unfortunately, a lot of the internet is full of racist, disgusting people. <laughs> you know, like there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of garbage on the internet and garbage in, garbage out. And uh, a company like Microsoft, unfortunately, thought that that would just be a fun thing to add. And they're 
chatbot, uh, which was called Tay. And it, it, I think it lasted about a month online before people realized that they could have conversations about really um, profane, uh, you know, like things that were just not kosher at all. So um, they took it down. Um, OpenAI's um, perspective on this after having seen what had happened with Microsoft and many other examples of this um, was to slowly roll out the service to a handful of people and see where it could go wrong and try to build in the profanity filters into the service. So they control the model for GPT-3. You don't actually get access to the model. You get access to a service which allows you to generate from the model. And that way they can actually control the generation a bit more. Yeah, so how closely they're monitoring that is, you know, anybody's guess, but um, Microsoft has released news recently saying that they are, the, they somehow got sole access as a licensor for the service and, you know, they will be learning to profit from that service, even though this is a nonprofit that has created this uh, model. So, you know, as, as you look online, maybe you, um, after having played with these techniques or even already now, you might be suspicious of like a text comment on somebody's photo or uh, a news article even. And you might be asking yourself like, well, what can we do about this? You know, like, is, it, is this just going to continue to happen or can we create a better, perhaps like a discriminator of news articles and comments? Can we somehow learn to detect that that is fake and that that is accurate and real and came from a person? And my view on this is that, unfortunately, no, I don't think that this is the answer. And even though there are plenty of people working on this, um, if you have seen the movie War Games, um, there's this really famous uh, line in it that uh, they're playing tic-tac-toe with uh, this artificial intelligence, whatever. And uh, they decide, you know, like, is there any way that it can just play itself? And they set the number of players to, to zero and it plays itself endlessly and endlessly and plays like every permutation of this game until the AI, you know, responds, greetings, Professor Falk and hello, a strange game. The only winning move is not to play. And I feel that way about machine learning sometimes, like, you know, with generation of content and discrimination of that content, they go hand in hand. Like, you know, if you learn to generate better, the discriminators will learn to get better. But at the same time, the generation will also get better. And it's just like endless and endless until the, you know, who knows what happens. Um, so that's, that's kind of one narrative that I wanted to lead you on. And um, this kind of also the premise for an entire class of algorithms that we're going to look at called the generative adversarial network, where the whole premise of this algorithm is to learn to generate, but at the same time learn to discriminate in order to make the generator better. Um, so we'll be looking at that more closely. Moving on, um, certainly, you know, aside from discriminators, and you, there's perhaps another way to think about um, protecting content uh, in the field of digital media, we often have to think about whether or not there are rights attached to the media that we're working with. So when we view content on Instagram, Facebook, Google search or whatever, um, if we're copying content, uh, there's already, you know, something that we have to consider as uh, using that content for creating a generative algorithm, let's say, <clears throat> Are we breaking somebody's copyright? Are we using media that had been labeled, you know, you know, non-commercial, non, or had to be attributed? Um, you know, different aspects of that media might be licensed. And um, if we <clears throat> learn to ingest all that content, we've somehow circumvented all of these legal issues by, you know, training a model which has learned to generate that content. And so. It's a really, really interesting question to me. And um, I'll jump in just a very little on this topic. Uh, what is copyright infringement? Anybody have ideas on what that is? Yeah, please answer if you have an idea. 
using someone else's intellectual or creative property without licensing or permission. Yeah, without licensing or permission, yeah. Great, yeah, so these are all really good answers. Um, really what con copyright infringement is, is when a content right holder claims to hold the rights of the content and further claims that another party is infringing on their rights to that content. So it involves a legal battle, effectively. Like there is no, there's no like, you know, that happened or not. There's no like binary solution to it. It involves being sued, first of all. So you have to be in a court room and, um, or have settled, which is often what happens. Um, <clears throat> but there's really no clear answer on this, unfortunately. And it gets really murky when you start talking about generative algorithms, because then like, what, what are we even talking about? Like there's a mathematical equation associated with the generation of that content as well. So good luck explaining that to a jury. Um, so often there's a cease and desist notice uh, as associated with um, copyright infringement. And uh, if you have, uploaded anything to YouTube, um, which may have included music or sound or even bits of images that came from a supposed content right holder of that content. YouTube's content ID algorithm is very good at finding that bit of content and saying, look, that actually belongs to this content right holder and automating this whole process of a cease and desist. And they'll take your video down or they'll assign it like they'll put ads on it to buy that content and like they'll do all sorts of things. It's um, pretty scary, I think. Um, I have a YouTube smash up series called YouTube smash up and uh, you can find this online, um, which tried to interrogate this process more directly. Um, this process used the top 10 videos on YouTube as content and tried to regenerate the number one video um, using the remaining top 10 videos and it did this for audio and video and so it, it wasn't actually using the number one most viewed video as its content but using all the other videos as its content and it was reassembling it as this collage that would try to look like the number one most viewed video and it was really interesting what happened was that most of the videos were taken down due to copyright claims um, but on the number one videos, not on the two to 10 videos, which the content was actually being used of. So uh, I think that was a interesting narrative that kind of exposed some of the faults with YouTube's um, automated processing of these algorithms uh, around copyright. And if you want to read more about this, there's many threads of thought here. Um, I'm not going to go into them uh, yeah, so there's many threads of thought here that uh, we can jump into, but we won't have time to around uh, Le Electronic French Foundation, Frontier Foundation, I forget what it stands for. Uh, Creative Commons, which is a license that you can apply to your media or that other media creators will have applied to their media. Um, Aaron Schwartz, which was already mentioned. If you don't know who he is, please look up his history. Uh, Copy Left and Lawrence Lessig, the Harvard Law Professor. Um, yeah, but I won't uh, have enough time to go on to all of these. Um, also wanted to mention uh, this, this piece by Julian Oliver, which I really like, uh, playing with the idea of licensing in the public space. Uh, so here he's um, playing with the idea of surveillance capital and understanding that this material should probably belong to the public. And so he's put this um, uh, this decal over the capture of this um, uh, CCTV, which I thought was very clever. Okay, moving on. So some of the questions that we'll tend to ask when working with generative systems and that, you know, as I've worked with other artists and my own work have tended to ask and um, really we're all kind of just waiting for Google to be sued really so that we know the answers to these questions, but for now, uh, these are some of the questions that we all have to ask is that, you know, who owns the content generated by a generative system? If you're going to read all of the 
I don't know, the, the books from a public archive of books and then generate another book, like, is that your book? <laughs> Maybe some of the phrases from that book are actually from other books and you'll be sued at some point. So think about that. Um, also, who owns the IP, the intellectual property of the generative systems code? Like maybe you're using NVIDIA's algorithm for generating images and they actually have a license assigned to that generative system that says any images created from that uh, code belong to NVIDIA. And uh, you kind of have to raise an eyebrow at that, like, well, how, one, how would they know? And two, um, is that even like, a, is there a legal precedent for that? Is there any real legal system that would uphold that? Um, I don't really think there is, I'm not sure at least. Um, so we're all kind of just waiting for people to get sued so the law can interpret, you know, uh, what what is really meant by these things. Uh, so yeah, fun times, interesting times for content generation. All right, so we've talked a lot about things that are perhaps not what you thought this course would be about. And uh, we'll start to talk about things that hopefully you <laughs> wanted to learn in this course. <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, its history, um, really um, what artificial intelligence is and like what the kind of maybe general population understanding of artificial intelligence is might look a little bit something like this. So uh, Boston Dynamics, now owned by Google, is a, I believe now you can even order these things as consumers, which is just like absurd to me because these are really like military industrial robotics. And, um, but this is a class of artificial intelligence which involves um, sensing and acting. Uh, it doesn't use machine learning, strangely. Like that would be, that was my first thought, you know, when I saw these things like, oh yeah, sure, they must have like done a lot of self-play simulation out there in the world and learned to walk. But in fact, this is using um, an entire different class of artificial intelligence, which is sometimes called like good old fashioned AI or algorithms or rule-based AI systems, things like decision trees and uh, heuristics cobbled together. And um, uh, that kind of looks like, you know, decisions that are often forks in a road. Like if the weight on my left leg is greater than some amount, then move this right leg like that, you know. And um, that's how a lot of these uh, robots work. And they are probably the scariest AI that you'll ever see. And um, you can buy one, so look forward to that. <laughs> uh, there's also a whole other class of machine learning, um, which we also won't go into. And this is uh, natural motion. Euphoria, I think is the name of the engine that natural motion created. And I'm not opening these links right now, just in the interest of time, but you can um, look at these links on your own and uh, see that this is actually a um, uh, algorithm that uh, models uh, ragdoll physics in games. Um, so if you've ever played Grand Theft Auto V or seen any material from that, you'll have seen like somebody gets shot by a bullet or whatever and like, or, like tumbles over like a car or something like that. Um, the dynamics of that um, soft body physics, the, the, the thing that looks like that person, the dynamics of that are all modeled through um, artificial intelligence and that uses a type of machine learning um, which we won't be looking at in this course, but it's a, it's a really impressive class of algorithms. Um, the same sort of class of algorithms has gone on to um, compete in things like, uh, you might have seen Lee Sedol, the uh, Go Grand, I forget what the title of the Go Master is, but the, you know, like the um, top rated Go player had um, uh, played against Deep Minds which is the name of this company um, owned by Google, they had played against their artificial intelligence and, um, and they had beat Lisa Dole, you know, in, in a certain number of games, basically. And they, they basically learned through self-simulation, self-play. 
uh, which is um, the same sort of algorithm that natural motion uses for learning their uh, physics. So there's this kind of idea of, I will create this entire world where you know, I'll study the actions and states of that world and I can create um, every possible thing that could occur in that world. And then I'll have some reward function that says like, yes, you learned it, or no, you, you still don't know what it is. You still don't know how to walk or you still don't know how to beat me at Go. And um, that uh, is a whole class of algorithms that um, we unfortunately won't be looking at, but it is a really, really interesting aspect of machine learning. Um, there's also, um, news within the same team at DeepMind, they had built a um, uh, model for StarCraft uh, 2 to like beat, you know, like any other previous game engines, AIs, and that um, uses the same premise as well. Okay, uh, let's see, moving on. We have uh, yet another type of AI here, which is, um, practically every social media news feed, including Facebook's news feed, um, <clears throat> learns to prioritize and personalize the media that you see using an effectively a personalized AI that's been tailored for you. It learns what you like, what you dislike. It learns what your friends like, what posts are likely to do well, who's popular, who's not, who's paid to target somebody like you, um, what your photos contain. Uh, what your advertisers want your photos to contain, uh, whose photos are in your faces and what those people look like, optimizes all of that together and it produces a feed just for you. Um, so we're not going to look at this type of algorithm either, but uh, this certainly falls under the purview of artificial intelligence as well. Uh, let's see, self-driving cars, Tesla, um, Tesla's autopilot, again, another type of AI. And this uses many different types of neural networks in combination with vision sensors to understand what is likely moving around you, where the road is, um, whether it should move the steering wheel left or right, slow down, speed up, what the road signs are, what the traffic is around you. And um, we're going to be looking at some aspects of computer vision, like the um, image generation networks that we're going to be looking at are modeled, they use the same components as these algorithms that are used for um, these ensemble learning type of uh, problems that you see in Tesla's autopilot systems. Um, so we'll be learning the building blocks for these, but we're not going to be using them for building a self-driving car, obviously. Okay, and then lastly, voice assistants. Um, again, another really popular use of AI that, um, perhaps many of you have used. Uh, so these are, again, personalized agents, just like the personalized newsfeed. These are AIs that sit on your phone and they learn your voice. They learn your vo friends' voices, your family's voices. They learn where you live. Um, if it's on your phone, then they learn where you're going, what you're likely to do. They'll track your movements, GPS, accelerometers. They're basically building this very rich profile of you through your internet browsing history, even storing cookies and tracking your moves online. And even if they say they're not, they're reading your messages, they're listening and building a very rich profile of who you are. And um, we're going to be looking at slices of this problem of voice assistance. And um, that problem is uh, text-to-speech, essentially. So like how we deliver um, um, speech generation, but there's like, you know, there's countless more aspects of AI being used for voice assistance that we're not going to be looking at. All right, um, let's see. And then we kind of touched on robotics a bit and um, I wanted to give you a flavor of what uh, exists out there in the arts world, in the community. Um, we saw Boston Dynamics as a, an example of AI being used and in the, um, space of industry, but there's a really rich history of um, robotics in, in the arts world as well, which I think is really fascinating. And we could start with earlier than Harold Cohen, like in 1968, there's a very famous exhibit in ICA London, Cybernetic Serendipity, Bruce Lacey, um, look him up if you're interested in robotics in the art space. Um, 
but Harold Cohen is a good place as any to look at. And um, here he's, he's built this program for this uh, tiny robot pictured on the right. And the program was really simple. He defined a small set of rules that forms the uh, computer composed drawings that you see. He called the um, drawing turtle, uh, or, which is just like this robot um, equipped with the marker. And then he would later fill in the um, sketches. Uh, so he was very interested in this idea of the internal aspects of human cognition. And it was a, he was trying to find these sort of functional primitives that were used in building a mental image, and then consequently in making uh, drawings and paintings. He, he never really said that Aaron was creative, and there's like all of these debates in, that you can look at, I think, um, on this idea of computational creativity. I find most of them really boring, so I don't talk about it. But if you want to dig into that narrative, there there is a lot of work there. If you search the terms um, um, computational creativity. Um, but he was asked at one point, like, is Aaron creative? And he's very famously um, noted for saying that if Aaron is not making art, what is it exactly? And in what ways other than its origin does it differ from the real thing? If it's not thinking, what exactly is it doing? So um, I like that response because it's a question, you know, it's not saying that it is or it isn't something, but it's, it's provoking the question. And I think that's what a lot of good art does. Uh, let's see. So uh, fast forward um, 30 years later, we have Patrick Trosset here, who developed this uh, robot that is on this um, school desk in front of him. And it's an artificial intelligence that uses both a drawing apparatus as well as a vision apparatus. And the vision apparatus uses techniques in the field of computer vision, or like how, how do we enable visual perception of computers? That's what I mean by computer vision. And um, again, we won't really get into this vast subfield of AI, um, which in, in his case marries uh, robotics as well as computer vision. But there is this whole other world of AI that's um, looking at these aspects of action perception. Um, but we will look at image generation, which is a very, very, very small slice of the idea of computer vision. And then more recently, even still, we have Su Guan Chung, who um, in a manner similar to Paul Tres, um, Patrick Tresse's Paul, she combines autonomous robotics, but rather than having this passive observer that is then sketched by the robot, she becomes a duo, a co-creator of the visual art with this robot, which I think is really fascinating. Okay, um, this is more introductory, so I have actually prepared a lot of slides, but in every other lecture, we won't have this amount of slides. There will be just very few, like if any, and there will be a um, working session, like through the tech that we'll be looking at, and um, the slides will really just be the cultural context for that tech that we'll, we'll be looking at together. So this is really um, getting us up to speed with all of it, kind of. All right, I'm going to start. Um, we're looking now at yet another kind of um, aspect of uh, AI and within the art space that I think is relevant to position this course in relation to. Um, we're not specifically looking at the types of machine learning algorithms that um, are used in surveillance uh, typically. So although this is a really prescient topic within AI, within the content generation machine learning algorithms, which is you know the subclass, um, it's less, uh, let's say uh, relevant, but it's, it's certainly a, a huge topic and if it integrates within your practice I think it's really uh, a great um, thing to continue to look at. Um, I want to mention a couple artists that are working in this space that are, are really inspiring. Lauren McCarthy I'm sure all of you have if you're not first years have um, perhaps taken a course with or know about. Uh, she's a lecturer here at um, uh, DMA and she created this uh, amongst many other really fascinating works, she created this work um, crowdsourced uh, in crowdsourced dating called Social Turkers. And um, it's 
built, I think, as a comment on social interactions that could be mediated by third parties. And so that might not be too dissimilar from a service that we'd imagine a voice assistant like Siri or Amazon Alexa offering. And uh, her other work has tackled similar veins of thought, like flipping this narrative of having an automated intelligence, but actually replacing the artificial part with actually a, a, a human behind the scenes. And um, it builds very interesting questions, I think. Uh, there's this other really fascinating work by uh, James Bridle, The Autonomous Trap. I, it was like a footnote, perhaps. <laughs> um, but it was a really interesting work, I thought, which used these ground markings to, um, like, hypothetically, like, I'm sure it didn't actually use a self-driving vehicle, but, you know, um, ground markings in the idea that this might trap an autonomous vehicle um, and treating this as like a no entry glyph, you know, like a, a sort of uh, political statement, like a, a sort of wall, let's say that, you know, if I have these glyphs and I'm basically saying, you know, I don't want that. I don't want these self-driving cars, you know? Um, so that, I thought that was a very interesting, um, you know, kind of simple uh, act really. Uh, another work by uh, Kyle McDonald, uh, LA artist, um, and here he has created this website, which you can still see, it's still functioning live. <clears throat> I just captured this image yesterday, I think. And this is in Beijing, and he's commenting on <clears throat> this uh, 1974 literary work um, by Georges Parik, um, probably butchering that name. Um, but uh, called uh, an attempt at exhausting a place. And I believe the story goes that he had like sat in um, on some park bench or something and tried to record, record all the observations of everything that occurred that normally go unnoticed. And so here he's built this website, um, which allows humans to annotate, you know, what's happening on the scene through this website. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of, computer vision based systems, which will do this automatically. So he's kind of building this other narrative here, which I thought was very interesting. Okay, so um, I think that's it for tangential fields that uh, are related, but we won't be looking at. And uh, we can now dive into machine learning. Right, so simply put, machine learning is a method for building algorithms from learning by learning from data, learning from data. It might not be real data, it could be simulated, uh, but in either case, it's a subclass of artificial intelligence. So we've seen, uh, you know, within robotics and all these self-play simulation things, these other ideas of machine learning. Um, so it's not the only type of artificial intelligence, but um, there are AI that don't learn from data, um, but machine learning requires data. And we can't talk about machine learning without also talking about learning, as in how humans learn. And, you know, humans don't learn in a void, but we learn within an environment. We're task-driven beings. We are active in our process of learning. We use sensory mechanisms, you know, all the stuff on our face and our skin. Um, we use sensory mechanisms and representations to support our ongoing perception of the world. And so one, one question that drives me through uh, practically everything I've done with machine learning is how does machine learning differ from human learning? Like what, is, what are the compromises and choices that we've created in, in that algorithm to perceive that thing um, that a human wouldn't do? And what are the environments and active processes and learning for a machine, if any. You know, if you really want to understand machine learning, those are some of the questions that you'll have to ask. So uh, let's take a look at some artists that are using machine learning, and in particular, uh, why machine learning is even relevant to artists. Uh, you know, 2012 or so, like machine learning wasn't really on many people's consciousness and like there wasn't really too much happening in the art space certainly for it um, but recently there was an auction by Christie's of all people to auction off what they 
called the first ever piece of AI art. And here this um, piece was expected to go for seven to $10,000 and it sold for $432,500. And uh, this is a 250 year old auction house. So why is Christie's care about AI art all of a sudden? <laughs> Um, this collective was called Obvious. Uh, there are three members of Obvious. There's a trio of 25-year-old French students, and um, they used a, you know, off-the-shelf, I would say off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm, something that you, you know, would learn about in this course, you know. Um, again, a generative adversarial network. <clears throat> they created the photo, um, and they trained this uh, uh, algorithm on historical portraits and then um, framed it and signed it even with the generative adversarial networks um, optimization function on the bottom right there which is just you know whatever you want to make of that um, there's a question of like why is that now relevant for Christie's why wasn't it before moving on um, we have one of the major um, museums in London the Barbican uh, last year, I think, um, having a major perspective on AI artwork. And this was a um, exhibition called AI More Than Human. And here we have the work by um, an artist, S. Devlin, uh, called Poem Portraits. And uh, uh, this uses many facets, facets of computational arts, including a facial mesh reconstruction, <clears throat> and it projects um, some text onto this face of this portrait of uh, a person inside of this photo booth. And uh, the text is all generated from poems. And uh, we're, we'll be looking at the text generation part of this, but not the uh, facial mesh reconstruction part of this. Um, uh, so this, this is a, an algorithm that we'll be looking at later. <clears throat> And also this exhibition, uh, AI More Than Human, you can read the curator's text online and learn more about the other artists involved in this work, um, in this exhibition. There's a lot of um, interesting work there. And then uh, more, even more recently, this year in San Francisco, uh, there's the De Young Museum. And this is a LA-based artist, Martine Sims. Um, and this is a view of the work. I have, haven't actually personally seen this, <clears throat> so I'm um, going off of what I've read about it online. Um, I've, I've worked with Martine and I've worked with S as well in the last piece, um, but just on the technical aspects. Uh, but here, this work, has anyone actually gone to see this in San Francisco, in the De Young Museum, perhaps? Okay, so here she's um, working on, um, she tends to work with her own um, experience of the world and um, in here she's created this work called Mythic Being um, and the name of the De Young Museum's exhibition was Uncanny Valley, Being Human in the Age of AI, which you know kind of has the same tropes let's say as the Barbican exhibition on uh, more than human like kind of playing on this idea of like humanity and being human and like having this other thing there. Um, what does that mean? No. <clears throat> but anyway, so Martine Sims, she's worked on this uh, text-to-speech engine using her own voice and um, has this avatar of her own body to simulate what she calls an anti-Siri. And uh, she's quoted as saying, mythic being, thick, because she's got hips. Uh, uh, she says of the bot, you know, that's what she's talking about. So this human scale instance of AI, which Sims has uh, named Teeny, responds to its audience through text, acting deliberately and exaggerating um, this self-centered manner. And um, it's something that you kind of just have to uh, like listen to her radio shows or podcasts or, you know, get to know her a bit more and you'll see like, oh yeah, she's, she's definitely an anti-Siri. Like <laughs> if anybody could be an anti-Siri. She also is quoted as talking about mythic being as uh, the agent that doesn't want to serve you. <laughs> and so she kind of has this assert assertive avatar that tries to upend this like subservient nature of digital assistants, you know, like generally they're overtly gendered identities and they encourage some like obedience relationship. Um, and she's kind of flipping that script here. 
Cool. So I will move on a bit and um, just talk about, you know, why are we seeing this happen now? Like really machine learning algorithms, like if you really want to nail into it, they haven't really changed. You know, like we're, there are countless articles looking at like, oh yeah, actually this machine learning algorithm is really just a rehashing of this algorithm from 40 years ago. You know, like really the, the algorithms aren't what explain why machine learning is everywhere today. And in fact, there are, I would say, three major reasons why we're seeing machine learning uh, so prevalent, even within the art space today. And um, if you look before 2018, you'll find far less in terms of auctions or major galleries. And uh, perhaps that's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> Should the AI be the focus of the work, really? Um, but AI has been around for, say, 60 to 80 years, and um, the algorithms aren't a whole lot different, you know. So really, I think what's changed are there are now a lot of data collected by major players and released out there into the world um, by the big, you know, tech players, Google, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Intel, NVIDIA, just a handful of companies, really. And if you really kind of dig deep into these artists and the exhibitions, I think you'll find that those players play a role as well in the exhibitions and the artists in some respect. They will have some role there. So there's, there's a thread between the industry adoption of AI and the artists' um, kind of adoption of AI there as well. But beyond the big data, we also have now a lot more compute. So we're able to take in all of that data and process it in fractions of a second than what we could do, you know, 20 to 40 years ago. We have massive server farms. We even have totally new architectures. Um, the gaming industry has somehow built these things called graphics processor units or GPU um, units um, for short which are capable of massive parallel computation. And they were built really for, you know, modeling scenes and like parallel processing pixels to look like they were radiating light from a certain direction. But, you know, people figured out that you could also use that for scientific computing and it was a lot cheaper and would uh, be really beneficial for massive amounts of computing. And now you even have different types of architectures called tensor processing units being developed by Google and Intel has their own and like everybody's in this sort of hardware arms race of like who's going to use the architecture that um, all of this AI will run on. And in your phone, there's even neural processing units and like things that are pitched as like, oh, this will make that algorithm run that much faster. And, it's um, it's growing everywhere, you know these these specific modules for computing um, AI algorithms, and then of course the final ingredient is really just like you know the money and time to do it really. So I don't think it's the algorithms. The algorithms really aren't that special. Um, they look opaque, but they're not. Um, at the end of the day, they are like linear algebra things that. Um, you know, people called uh, matrix decomposition at one point and um, doesn't go that far beyond basic statistics. Um, but they, there is a really, there's generally a very, very complicated surface to it, which is obscured by math and things like that. So my job is hopefully to make it less obscure and get your hands on it and working with it. Okay. Um, and then more context, like where else are we seeing machine learning specifically making decisions? And um, this is a list that I'd come up with and there's potentially a lot more here, but you know, it's, it's everywhere really. So I won't dwell on this too much, let's see. So I mentioned that um, machine learning learns from data, but I haven't really explained how that happens like okay you've got data great i've got a photo collection can i make a machine learning algorithm now how does it make how does it make decisions fundamentally and so there are four classes of um learning algorithms and um this is a kind of a 
one way to group up machine learning algorithms. It's certainly not the only way, but let's say that this is one way. Um, supervised learning is generally what you'll find in industry. You know, there's often a uh, industrial application for learning from data to classify that data into one thing or another. So predictive policing, for instance, you know, like, is this person likely to commit a crime? Like, as dumb an idea as that is, that is unfortunately an application of supervised learning and likely to make a lot of money. Um, we're not going to be looking at that class of algorithms at all, really, um, because there's not too much application in the arts, so far at least, on those types of algorithms. Um, you know, like learning to uh, recognize speech would be an example of supervised learning. Uh, we're not going to be looking at that specifically. Um, we'll be looking at the other side of that, which is speech generation. So that, that along with pretty much every other generation algorithm that we'll be looking at is an example of unsupervised learning. And fundamentally, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is supervised learning comes with labels. It says, here's my data, but here's also a set of labels for that data. Whereas unsupervised learning says, mm, well, here's just some data. And uh, I want you to learn you know, what that data looks like, what it feels like, what, what it sounds like. And then if I ever ask you to make more data like it, you know, great. Uh, perhaps you've also learned some axes that are meaningful about that data, such as uh, you know, things that we would associate representations to, like uh, perhaps lightness of skin. If I gave you a face, a collection of faces, maybe there would be one axis of representation that encoded uh, the lightness of faces. There will be many other things um, that an algorithm will learn based on the data that we give it. And so uh, that will be a big question that we will dig into later is, you know, depending on the data, we're actually asking different questions of the algorithms. Um, so we'll dig into that a bit more next week specifically. <clears throat> then there's this other class of algorithms semi-supervised learning, which is trying to combine the two, um, but fundamentally to still do supervised learning. And then we've got reinforcement learning, which is some of the things that we talked about today. Um, agents in, um, in game engines, for instance, uh, or um, robots that need to um, perceive uh, the world and act in it, and their states and things like that. So we won't be looking at that either, but um, you know, robotics and the types of artists that we've seen within robotics, that would be a really great um, avenue to look at if you were interested in that, but we won't be looking at that in this course. And then there's this kind of other bullet point just for generally, there's like other optimization methods, but um, we won't be going into that either. All right. Let's see. So moving on, we've got now data. And fundamentally, you know, I've talked a bit about this idea of unsupervised learning, learning representations. And so I'll continue with this idea of an image collection, um, but the same holds for text and for uh, sound. You know, what is it for a computer to look at an image versus me? Like I look at the world around me and I see, neurons are firing, you know, three to four times a second, I'm moving my eyes and like the world is somehow continuous and uh, rich and understanding like there's depth and, you know, a computer looks at the world and it sees like pixels. It sees each individual pixel one at a time dis discretized. Those pixels are effectively sets of numbers, really. Like, you know, on the right here we have um, the number representations of these grayscale grayscale values on of the picture on the left, and here this is a grayscale image encoded with eight bits of information per pixel. And eight bits just means that um, I have two hundred and fifty six possible values for each pixel. Two to the eighth is two hundred and fifty six. That's what's meant by eight bit. And so here we have. 
a series of numbers that somehow looks like a downscaled version of somebody's face, right? And perhaps you even know whose face this is, I don't know. Um, so a computer could learn from these series of numbers, you know, based on an, uh, an objective. If it were supervised learning, that objective might be learn that this is the picture of this person and that th these other series of numbers is a picture of some other person. Or in the unsupervised case, which is what we're going to be looking at, is really fundamentally looking at the patterns associated with these numbers and learning that, you know, when I see this um, set of dark pixels here that I expect to see either like this type of light pixel underneath it or some other set of pixels, depending on what was in my data. You know, like it's, it's trying to learn the fundamentally the, the input space of the uh, data, not some arbitrary output space. And we call that density modeling in machine learning um, is one way to think about it. Modeling the density of the data. <clears throat> so we'll look at that a bit more. Another way to think about this is, um, let's say that each circle on this plot represents one image. And so I had given, I had 100 images, and rather than think about each image as all of these numbers, I just have two numbers to describe each image. And I plot each number on one of these two axes. Let's say it was the average brightness of the image and the amount of red in the image. And I plot that on each axis. So this has like very low brightness and very low redness. And this is some other image which had much more brightness and much more redness. And so now I've got this set of dots on a plot. That's fundamentally what machine learning looks at. It looks at things like this and tries to learn, oh yeah, there's a lot more data that looks like this. So um, I'm going to group those up and that's going to be one thing. And then there's all this, uh, all these other images that have these same features that, you know, that's well clustered. I'll put that into another group. And uh, that's, that's kind of what machine learning is doing, you know. Uh, we might, in supervised learning, you know, the, the case where I want to label that one thing, that one group, and the other thing, the other group, I might know that that, um, that image represented some label, uh, like those were more red images, and over here I have images that were less red, or whatever that label might be, like the person A and person B. Um, and I want my algorithm to then say, like, given any new image, tell me, is it, is it this red thing or is it this blue thing? So supervised learning, uh, there is some label assigned with each example that I give it. And it's trying to model this boundary between the two labels, such that like here, this new set of features that came from a new example image it would be able to label it. Are there any questions on this? We'll, we'll come back to this again in the coming weeks, but um, let me know if there are questions. All right. Um, the other method which I mentioned is what we're fundamentally going to be looking at in this class is unsupervised learning. So we have no idea what this data is, but we do have some set of features that represent that image. It could be the raw image pixels, or in the case of this weird example I gave you, like, you know, each image represents these two things. And what we're trying to do is put them into arbitrary groups. Like, I haven't told the algorithm that there should be these groups, but it figured out, like, oh yeah, there are all these groups. And um, if you want a new thing, uh, I can generate it for you, and it will look like that group here for instance. So that's, that's just a, another example of this unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, we've got decisions. We're trying to model things into fixed groups that we know, that we say to the algorithm what they are. And then in unsupervised learning, we're trying to model the density of the data. We're actually building things that look more like the input space. And um, we call that density modeling or unsupervised learning. 
So here we have an example of um, an algorithm trained on images of faces. And uh, these are all generated examples from the model. So, um, you know, in the case of this only had two features, so it's plotted on two dimensions, but you know, an image actually has like way more features, every single pixel and every single RGB value of every pixel. So I can't plot that on two dimensions, but um, it's the same idea, you know, that there would be multiple dimensions of input spaces. And then I'm saying, you know, give me something that's near that image that I gave you. You know, like what, what would that image look like? And then it gives me a new image and it looks like, like this. So we'll see that a bit more later in the course, you know, as we tackle each um, machine learning algorithm, uh, we'll see a bit more about unsupervised learning for images, for text and for sound. Um, but next week we'll be working with data first. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to skip these next two sections because we're going to look at them in the later lectures um, and dig more into deep learning first. Okay, so we talked about AI, we talked about machine learning as a subclass of AI, and then we've got this other thing, deep learning which is even yet again another subclass of machine learning. And uh, it has a very rich history. So I wanna just give you a bit of it now, um, so you're familiar with it, but you know, it's nothing that you have to know. Uh, definitely provides a lot of context for the algorithms that we're going to look at. So it's, it's well worth understanding and the history of it is actually really fascinating. So this stuff was built during the Second World War, like the early stages of this was um, cybernetics in the 40s, built by people like McCulloch and Pitts and Donald Hebb, uh, Norbert Weiner and Alan Turing. Um, those were the really like early stages of these algorithms and they were of course motivated by um, war. You know, they were military technology. Uh, there weren't Google or Facebook then, you know, but there were, there was, um, at least towards the 60s, there was the advanced research programs and uh, ARPA, I forget what ARPA stands for, maybe if anyone knows what that is. But there was basically military um, vehicles that were pushing a lot of this technology and uh, the early technology were essentially um, uh, communications technologies. So there would be an encrypted radio message and you have to decrypt it and understand like what is that message, you know? And people that could send encrypted and uh, in people that could send encrypted messages were, you know, uh, in Britain and yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Vintage DARPA, exactly. They added the D and uh, you got now the modern ARPA today is DARPA, which funds a lot of military research. And you might have seen in the news um, statements by people like Google and Facebook saying that they won't work on contracts by DARPA or whatnot. But then again, who knows? I don't know. I remain skeptical. Um, so to bring it back to the 50s, you know, we've got this uh, communications. Um, algorithms trying to learn how to encrypt messages but at the same time decrypt messages and uh, we have very early algorithms as well in the 50s we're looking at here an image of the um, mark one perceptron this was developed in the cornell aeronautical lab in buffalo new york in 1957 and uh, this was developed by a cognitive scientist frank rosenblatt he invented and constructed the perceptron it was the first operative artificial neural network and um, at that time, it was a military secret, it was classified. And um, the first prototype of the perceptron was uh, an analog computer. It had 20 by 20 photocells, which were meant to try to um, mimic the retina. You know, the retina is a lot higher resolution. Um, 
but the idea was that there would be these photocells in place of retinal cells and they would be connected to wires of layers of artificial neurons that would resolve into some single output such as a light bulb turning on or off. So that would be a supervised algorithm like trying to learn that you know given these photocells I, I know that it is one or zero. I'm trying to learn the artificial weights that would take these photocells and project them into a zero or a one, trying to find that decision boundary. And so um, it learned simple shapes like letters and triangles. Um, it's, it's totally absurd to me that this was a physical thing. Like, I still don't think I would know where to begin, how to build something like that, but it is mind boggling. That was in 1957. Um, yeah, if you'd like to learn more about this, look up Frank Rosenblatt and the history of the Mark I perception. So fast forward, you know, to modern day neural networks, let's say, we've got many of the same ideas and components, but just a lot more of it. We've got, instead of 20 by 20, we've got 1,024 by 1,024 images. And instead of, you know, um, I forget how many weights he had, but you know we have billions of weights. <laughs> so try building that physically into a light bulb. Good luck. But you know it's, a, it's more or less the same algorithms, and we've learned how to train the weights on those algorithms much better. Uh, we've learned how to regularize and build like better dynamics on the trainings of those algorithms. But fundamentally, the algorithms of the neural network has stayed the same. Um, the other thing that's happened is that we've learned to build more layers. So rather than have this one layer that encodes some representation of that input space, it might be edges or um, some something that would say that, you know, given 20 images of oranges and 20 images of apples, you know, I'm going to build a weighting that says, if I see more red pixels, then that's going to be an apple. And that these weights would take the individual pixels in the center of that image that are likely to be red and say, if there's more ones there, that's going to be an apple uh, in the red channel. And if, it's, if not, then it's an orange. That's my algorithm. It's great. I've got a 1980s neural network. The modern day neural networks are deep meaning that there, there's just a lot more layers of weights. And so kind of understanding what each layer does has be, been an issue for a lot of people, and uh, there's a lot of great resources on it. We'll look at that as well, I think in the third, third week lecture, um, trying to visualize and understand like what are these intermediate layers doing to an image to understand that that is, um, that person, you know, like what are the representations if it's encoded within these deeper layers? And there are ways to interrogate that. We can actually look at this one weighting, which says, you know, how to weight each individual pixel. And if you visualize the weightings of those pixels, it sort of looks like, you know, like uh, perhaps it's a piece of a nose, like a very particular type of nose. And, um, as you get deeper and deeper into the layers of these neural networks, the um, features or types of things that resemble features, um, they get more and more broad over the course of that image. So the early um, features might look like simple edges, but then as you go deeper into the network, it goes closer and closer to the thing that looks like that image of that person. Okay, um, this is another uh, way of kind of um, interrogating the architecture of a neural network. This is a really good article. Um, it's probably like a two hour read. <laughs> so it's a very comprehensive article. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the components of this particular type of neural network, then um, I highly recommend you look at this article in more detail and distill.pub in general. They have a lot of really um, 
great resources for understanding um, advances in AI. And there are generally all like very interactive um, articles. So you you can kind of play with the neural networks and see like as I change this um, slider, uh, what would happen to the neural network over time as it learns to um, train, get trained to predict a thing like uh, numbers. So moving on slightly, we'll come back to that as well in later lectures, but moving on slightly, I mentioned one of the other big um, advances that has enabled AI today is, uh, and machine learning in particular, has, is that there's a lot of data. And uh, ImageNet pictured here, like a subset of ImageNet is pictured here rather, uh, contains about 20,000 categories of um, images, and this was released publicly. And each contain an average of about a thousand images. So in total about 14 million images that were gathered from Flickr and other various media sources. There have been cases with other data sets that um, Microsoft I'm thinking about that actually contained copyrighted photos of people's faces and unsuspecting people that were included um, that did not wish to be included. Um, MS Celeb, for instance. Um, but somehow ImageNet skirted that issue and it wasn't really ever raised. Um, but there are artists that have kind of picked up on that and looked at that in particular. Trevor Paglin has a work on that and, uh, if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, so this is an example of a data set that to this day is really used to train a lot of the um, largest uh, and state-of-the-art algorithms for image generation, for any type of classification on images, because it is just so comprehensive. Um, it certainly has a lot of faults as well, um, but this is probably the largest publicly available image data set um, that you can simply download. You know, you can create your own image data set, certainly much larger than that, um, but this has a lot of labels and that is very valuable for industry, you know, having clean data that is labeled. So this occurred in 2012, which is really when deep learning kind of saw this, you know, revival of like, wow, we can do things with deep learning that we didn't realize. And every single industry player kind of took that on and uh, started using it and adopting it into their um, different uh, applications, however they could. So I mentioned that, you know, these deep networks, as they get deeper, you know, like from the input space, where each one of these circles is a pixel, you know, I mentioned that the features of a neural network are whatever you want them to be. But in the case of image networks, they are each individual pixel. Uh, so as we go later and later into these layers, really the features that it ends up learning are more and more kind of higher scale primitives of that image. It learns how to um, detect edges of different orientations, of different scales, of different colors. Uh, and these really resemble what are in our visual cortex. In the first layer of six of our visual cortices, there is essentially a lot of edge detection happening. Um, and as you get into later uh, layers, you get corners in the second layer and the third layer, they start to look like textures. And by the fourth layer, you have some patterns. And then you get sort of these object primitives, like parts of objects, proto objects. And then finally, towards the last layers, you actually get objects themselves. Um, so you can read more about this in the Distill article and kind of interrogate like what, what is a neural network learning? Why does it know that this is an image of that thing? Um, yeah, and this is yet again another article that um, you can dig into that um, looks at more examples of data sets and how to visualize um, image classification neural networks in particular. And a lot of the techniques for learning what is what are in these neural networks are actually really fascinating techniques for visualization. Um, so we'll look a bit at that in the third week's lecture. All right. Um, 
wrapping up primarily now uh, the course outline. So this is very much subject to change because as I mentioned, this is a new course and um, this is really dependent on um, all of you in the course as well and the feedback that I get. But primarily what I want us to tackle is uh, this first week was a more introductory course looking at a bit of everything culturally. And um, in the following weeks, we'll be looking at more uh, involved, um, hands-on practical exercises. So next week, we'll be working on creating a data set with uh, Google Colab and Python and modeling basic statistics of that data set. Following that, we'll be looking at image features. Uh, what does it mean to create a feature for an image? Like if I want to um, generate content that looks a particular way, is there a sort of feature extractor for that image that I could use to then cluster and generate more images like it. Um, that's what we'll be looking at the following week. Uh, then we'll be looking at regression, uh, which is a type of machine learning algorithm um, and deep dream and style net. Following that, we'll be looking at generative adversarial networks, um, in particular, the style GAN2 and pix to pix networks. And we'll be looking at how to train our own model using uh, Runway ML, who have um, very, very graciously offered to um, provide free credits for us and uh, free subscriptions for all students. So that is really cool of them. Uh, as well, we'll be jumping in then to text and kind of revisiting all the things that we saw for image generations with, uh, with GANs. We'll be looking at that um, in the text space, looking at te text arithmetic, um, CAR RNN is an early example, GPT-2, and um, at least culturally looking at what's happened with GPT-3. And then following that, we'll have, um, we'll have sound generation, um, and there are various algorithms and topics within that that we'll get to look at. OpenAI's jukebox, um, MIDI generation, source separation, voice conversion, and text-to-speech. So it's a super, super ambitious plan, and there's a lot packed into each week, um, which is why <laughs> December 3rd and 10th are just like, you know, we'll see how far we get into each of these topics, and we'll, we'll very likely need more time. Um, but also it's it's an opportunity for you to um, suggest that, you know, I want to look at this particular thing. Um, can we look at that? And um, there's scope for that, basically. As well, uh, the final month will really just be um, support for you for your final project. Um, which brings me to the course grading. So uh, there's going to be six assignments, um, starting with one that I'm going to uh, give you tonight which will be due on Tuesday. Um, the assignments aren't really meant to be um, like super challenging, like they're not meant to be um, projects per se, but they are meant for you to spend time with the material and ingest it and deliver something. And each of the assignments are going to be um, deliverables, at least this first week, uh, first week's one is going to be a deliverable that you will have to present to the class. And so that's um, just kind of one way that I'm hoping that we can build some community with this class and have less of me talking as well, <laughs> which would be great. Um, attached to those assignments are feedback sessions. Um, sorry, it's uh, two per session might be a typo here. So we've got uh, feedback sessions, which are essentially um, you, as a cohort of students offering an exchange of ideas with, with your peers. So next week, uh, next week's homework delivered on Tuesday, you will present um, in place of me, you will be presenting. And at the end of that presentation, um, I would like you as uh, peers to offer some exchange of ideas on what was presented. So it can be, constructive criticism, it could be an attached idea, it can be um, an opportunity for uh, encouragement and growth, it could be uh, anything that you really want it to be. Um, this is meant to be a, uh, a way to build some sense of crit into this practice of um, technical 
uh, understanding of this course, as well as the critical understanding. So uh, other than that, than that, there is a final project, and that will be assigned um, towards the Thanksgiving break, and you'll have to present that during the finals week in December. And you'll see that there's 110%, so you know, there's an opportunity to skip an assignment or, you know, augment your grade, hopefully. Any questions on the course grading or the course outline so far? Okay, on to the homework, which you're all, I'm sure, very excited to hear about. Let's see. So for the homework, um, you have to read all of these articles. No, I'm just joking. So you have to pick one of, uh, you're only going to have to read one of the articles, but um, there's a huge list of things here. Some of them are videos. Uh, some are um, long articles. Some are shorter articles. Like doesn't mean that they're easier or harder or anything like that. It's just a kind of brain dump of things that are happening within the space of AI critically that I would love us all to collectively understand. Um, and so you will have to send an email to um, m myself and pick your top three choices. And then I will send back um, uh, which reading you were assigned and um, if you were assigned with a cohort as well. So I'll try to pair um, two to three people together. And um, if everybody picks the same one, then I'll try to go with the first one that uh, suggested that they wanted to, to read that. So try to get me your answers um, as soon as possible. So again, pick your top three favorites. Um, you can browse them and see kind of what's, what feels most interesting to you. Pick your top three by 8 p.m. tonight, and then I will reply with your cohort and your assigned reading. On Tuesday, you will have to present a five to eight minute presentation of that reading. And um, really what I'm hoping that you um, can do in that um, presentation is provide some context uh, perhaps some motivation if one exists, you know, like why was this thing created at all and um, dig into that and then provide a, a sort of overview of what it is that they, that article is doing. And um, that would then open up the floor for discussion on um, what that article was about. Uh, so it's, it's a bit challenging, I think, to condense any of these into five minutes. Um, that's kind of the point. <laughs> so enjoy the challenge and I hope that you'll enjoy as well forming a group. Again, eight, by 8 p.m. tonight, top three topics, and then I'll email you back the topic that you were assigned along with your group members. And these slides, uh, perhaps an earlier version of these slides are available on the course website, but not nothing really has changed too much. Um, and then next week, we've got uh, on Tuesday, the student presentations and the feedback, and I'll have office hours following that. And Thursday, we'll have this introduction to Python using Google Colab and a lab session looking at building an image data set. One thing I forgot to mention um, is the Runway ML credits. Um, if you want to get a head start with that, uh, please let me know your runway ML email um, and then I can um, get that email assigned a free subscription and credits uh, when we start looking at GANs. So we're actually going to be using runway ML for this. Um, so by then we'll be playing with runway ML. It's just that um, Cristobal, the creator of this um, software has actually offered us free subscription and credits and that um, somebody mentioned they might be already paying for it so <laughs> it would be good if um, if you are paying for it already like you can actually get a free um, subscription and credits from him now. I think most of the intro material that I have seen was actually like overly complex and I'm <clears throat> hoping that the um, next week's um, lecture is actually like a, 
a fairly good introduction. Um, okay, perfect. That haven't coded Python and that haven't used Google Colab. And it's really, you know, hopefully you know what an if statement is perhaps, or like you have a vague idea of what it is, but you don't know the syntax or haven't really used it. That's okay. We'll work with that um, with code examples together next week.